having a hearing on strengthening the aviation workforce, and we have a distinguished panel here. I plan to have the majority of the, cheering, the hearing chaired by my colleague, Senator Duckworth, a pilot in her own right and chair of the subcommittee, and, uh, but I am going to make an opening statement and have our colleagues make opening statement, uh, Senator Moran, and then um, turn it over to her. Yesterday at the FAA Safety Summit, there was agreement that there has been an uptick in safety incidents from near misses to runway incursions. Among the critical action items is ensuing that we increase training to account for human factors in the cockpit and in the control tower. We've always had the risk of human error, but as we bring in new safety workforce, we must double down on the human factors and training. We also must have the right safety equipment to identify and prevent runway incursions and near misses, and these airport surface device detection systems that are deployed at some airports and other technologies like them can help air traffic controllers on track the movement of aircraft on the ground and facilitate communications between the tower and the cockpit. These type of investments are needed for situational awareness and to prevent incidents or accidents. So the FAA, I believe, must move forward with these safety upgrades. Um, as Captain Jason Ambrosia can tell us, this means having also enough qualified and talented individuals trained with the most up-to-date expertise in every work group, not just the pilots. The FAA workforce must keep pace too, and that's what we're here to discuss this morning. We must continue to invest in an FAA that has 45,000 employees, including 14 thousand air traffic controllers, 5,000 flight standard workers, and 1,500 aircraft certification personnel. So I look forward to hearing from David Spiro, representative of the FAA safety profession, on this issue. And from airlines to airports to aerospace manufacturers, Americans go to work each day basically depending on these individuals. According to the FAA, aviation contributed to more than 5% of our GDP, 1.9 trillion in total economic activity and supported 11 million jobs. The, ranking, the subcommittee uh, ranking member, Senator Moran, knows this well. He and I work um, on a lot of issues trying to train and skill a workforce for tomorrow. And as this footprint continues to grow, we see the economic opportunities for our nation. According to the Department of Transportation, the U.S. airline industry employed 787,328 workers in January of 2023, nearly 8% more than the pre-pandemic time period of 2019. The U.S. aircraft manufacturing sector is expected to hire more than 10,000 workers in 2023 a production, as production increases continue to rise. And careers in this field offer highly skilled, good-paying jobs with an average salary um, over 106,000, about 40% above the national average, according to the Aer Aerospace Industry Association. So we're proud of this talented workforce, particularly in my home state. The state of Washington is home to more than 100 and 30,000 aerospace workers, and the supply chain that works with more than 1,500 suppliers. With post-pandemic aviation growth, we now face new challenges, and we need to develop a pipeline of qualified workers to replace those who either retired or voluntarily left the workforce during the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the next 20 years, to meet projected growth in commercial aviation, we will need 120 8,000 pilots, 134,000 maintenance technicians, 173,000 crew members in North America alone. So big opportunities for us to skill and train a workforce for the jobs of tomorrow that are already here today. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about how we can expand access to aviation jobs through all parts of America. Now more than ever, we cannot afford to leave good talent on the table. Dr. Bechtry Lute will tell us about women and people of color and how they're still underrepresented in aviation careers and that bridging this gap to, is a key to ensuring a strong aviation system and certainly making education, pilot uh, access to that diverse workforce more affordable so that they can get the skill set of the future. Women represent roughly 5% of airline pilots, less than 12% of aerospace engineers, 
and yet make up 47% of the total workforce. So we got to bridge the gap, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. I want to thank Ms. Von Mulholland for being here um, from Alaska Airlines. Uh, we talked last week, and she had a very compelling story about her own career and what they are trying to do to meet the gap locally in the Pacific Northwest. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, less than 15% combined, uh, com combined of pilots and engineers are of, uh, uh, black or Hispanic or, or Asian. And uh, we are going to hear about what we can do to build this pipeline for the future. Um, the cost of flight education, as I mentioned, is one of those barriers. A traditional four-year institution can range past $100,000 subject to rising tuition fees. And that is why we need to consider policies that will help drive down those costs and get more students into the aviation talent pool. In 2018, we led efforts here on an FAA grant program uh, to help develop a more inclusive talent pool of aviation pilots and aviation technicians. And today, I have letters for the record from two recipients of the 2023 FAA Workforce Grant recipients in the state of Washington. Aviation Technical Services in Everett and Red Tail Hawks Flying Club in Muckleteo, part of the Black Pilots of America. This funding will help Aviation Technical Services develop and train new airframe mechanics and support military veterans transitioning to a civilian workforce. And it will enable Red Tail Hawks, a flying club, to help underserved and underrepresented students access aviation education. These Washington State organizations are, are training the next generation of aviation professionals, and Congress should consider more ways to build up this successful program. I think we'll also hear about how the ROTC could play a very vital role, too. And uh, we should uh, consider that. So strengthening our aviation workforce, uh, having the right people, having the right skill sets, making sa safety in aviation the number one priority that is what we're here to discuss this morning. So thank you to all the panelists.